six astronauts as they train for a job that's out of this world. The Space Shuttle Endeavour is the newest in NASA's fleet of four reusable spacecraft. It was commissioned to replace Challenger, which exploded shortly after takeoff in January 1986, killing all on board. This is the story of Endeavour's tenth journey into space, just ten years later. The first time NASA has allowed anyone to film the inside story of a mission and the lives of the astronauts from the day they are chosen until they return to Earth over a year later. You guys have a good day at school. Okay, I'll see you later. Bye. Brian Duffy, colonel in the US Air Force, astronaut, and pilot of two previous shuttle missions, will be the commander of flight STS-72. There are over 100 US astronauts based at the Johnson Space Center, which sprawls for miles across the southern suburbs of Houston, Texas. Houston is America's space capital. This is where the astronauts live and train, and mission control is here. There have been over 200 astronauts since manned space flight began 35 years ago. The road into the Johnson Space Center is lined with rockets and spacecraft of the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs. The space shuttle has been flying for 15 years, and Brian Duffy will command its 72nd mission. This is the inside story of the six men chosen to be the crew of mission STS-72. Just before Christmas 1994, Chief Astronaut Bob Cabana announced the news at the Astronauts Weekly Meeting. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce the STS-72 crew. It will consist of Commander Brian Duffy, Brent Jett, Michi Wakata, Dan Berry, and uh, where's Leroy Chow? And last but certainly not least, Winston Scott. Good work, it's starting on Monday morning. Congratulations. All right. Hey, there's the boss. It's going to be fun. Hey, thank you. Congratulations. All right. First EVA hog to the second. Yeah, like that. All right, Mike. Sure is. Thank you. Thank you. Four of the astronauts chosen are new boys who haven't flown before, graduates of the class of 1992. Four of us on one ride. I didn't know last night. I found out this morning. Now, what did you say when you were there? This morning. That's right. So we can start on Monday morning. Oh, I got to go call. We're gonna have a good time. We got a lot to do. Crew training will take about a year. STS-72's main mission will be to capture a Japanese satellite. They will also carry out a series of spacewalks, testing tools and building techniques for the International Space Station. Kind of like to get us together just to okay. Uh, okay. spend a little bit of time and kind of bring folks up to speed on what's been going on with the flight so far. And I know you know parts of it, you know parts of it, and I, you know, I think I know probably how the whole thing fits together. So. So we, maybe we can get together this afternoon. So. How about you? How are you? I'm looking? pretty open this afternoon. Okay. I gotta, uh, you want to say, let's one to say, one o'clock. One o'clock. Okay. okay. One o'clock. Okay. 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 So we'll get together at one. All right. Thank you. Okay. Office. In your yeah, office. Yeah, my office. Okay. I better go call a hold. Yeah, you yeah, better call. I'm going to do that too. <laughs> Hello. Hi. How are you doing? Yeah. You sound as though you're anticipating something. Don't I always call at 8:35 in the morning? No, you don't. <laughs> I did not say anything last night. Well, that's good. Hey, we were very excited. 
quiet, were you? Good. Well, guess what? You, you've been assigned. That's right. They announced the 72 crew this morning. Well, and yours truly is MS2, flag engineer on the crew. So that's really something, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. Brian Duffy is the commander. Winston Scott will be the seventh Child black American to travel into space commander. and the second and to spacewalk. Brent Jett, Koichi, Dan Barry, and myself. Whatever language you get asked a question in, just answer okay. in that. And I would suggest that if it's in English, briefly restate the question in Japanese and then answer it again in Japanese. Koichi Wakata is, is the first sense. Japanese astronaut yeah, that, to be that, fully trained right. by NASA. It'll be pretty He's 32. Relaxed and one of the youngest space travelers. His special task will be to capture his own country's satellite with Endeavour's robot arm. Ellington Field, the space center's own airport. 25 years ago, Neil Armstrong practiced landing his lunar module here. Today, this is home for the astronauts' personal fleet of T-38 jets. Pilot astronauts must fly for four hours a week. The T-38s fly 700 miles an hour and can travel for two hours without refueling. The pilots use them like personal sports cars. The non-pilot astronauts use the T-38s as taxis, hitching lifts all over the USA from pilots keeping up their hours. Brent Jett will be the pilot of STS-72, Commander Brian Duffy's right-hand man. Got tickets, you want to go? Like, yeah. Brent Jett was top gun in the US Naval Academy, a star Navy fighter and test pilot before he joined the astronaut class of 1992. This is his first mission. I bet they're good seats too. I mean, they're like company seats, you know? Dr. Leroy Chow was a materials engineer in California before he became an astronaut. This is his second space flight and he will be STS-72's chief spacewalker. Dr. Dan Barry is the odd man out on this crew. An academic with double doctorates in engineering and medicine, he's also a millionaire who invented and patented a successful running shoe. He's another member of the class of 92. A six hour spacewalk will be the high point of the mission for him. The astronauts are based in Houston, but their spacecraft and the teams who maintain them are at the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral in Florida. in their T-38 jets, 800 miles in an hour and a half. Coming in to land at Kennedy, they pass over the two shuttle launch pads. Launch pad 39B is a 340-foot steel tower. The first shuttle to use this pad was STS-51L, the ill-fated Challenger.
This is the first of many visits for the crew of STS-72. Throughout their training, safety and emergency procedures will dominate their schedule. Gives you a real good idea just how big it is when you, when you get up here. After it's all tanked, it'll start to make noise. Yeah. Growing and creeping. Is that right? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, like it's, it's like it's alive when you come out on lunch morning, yeah. you know, all the gases that are venting off, you know. That's the big like, difference between TCDT and lunch day. <laughs> yeah. That, that and the fact that on lunch day, there aren't very many people out here. Yeah, right. As a matter, oh, as a matter yeah, of fact, right. just the crew and those that are going to strap you in, and that's it. Every other time you come out, you know, there are lots of folks working on the orbiter and getting it ready to go. Yeah, that's what the fireman Buck said to us when he was teaching us the firefight, and he was saying, you need to learn this, because when you're up here for real, Buck ain't going to be up here. <laughs> you're right, you're right. That's right. When the shuttle is ready to leave, the launch pad is a dangerous place. Endeavour's tanks contain over two million litres of highly explosive fuel. The astronauts, strapped in their seats for takeoff, are entirely on their own. The pad here has an emergency system in case there's a, a fire. If we were, in, if we were inside uh, before lunch and something happened and we needed to get out, and if there was a fire out there, they have a, if you notice these nozzles all along here as we come down, uh, they'd be activated, they'd be, they'd be dousing the area with water. Uh, well, there's an arm and a flow, the two paddles that are retracted right there, they'll be actually be out when we're in the vehicle. They'll set those before they leave after mm -hmm. strapping us in. So you can't miss and them as you come you, you can't, through. Right, you can't miss them. You come out, you hit those, it activates this system here, and then we'll do everything in the buddy system where there'll be two of us, so that way we're always looking out for each other. And um, those, your visibility will be really poor as you come through here. You'll have your visor down, water will be pouring on it, so you, that's why we have these arrows and the yellow walkway on the, on the floor, so as looking down, you can keep track of it, and you work mm -hmm. your way over towards the emergency escape baskets and go out there and one person will be in the lead and the other person generally just keeps a hand on the harness or something just keep in contact and always make sure you got your buddy with you so that you we do everything on the buddy system keeps everybody safe and you know ensures yeah. that we'll all get out of here now you could think of the vehicle as being a potential bomb the large orange tank contains the fuel to power endeavor's three main engines the white tanks are the solid rocket boosters they burn for two minutes to provide extra power for takeoff it was an O-ring, one of the black rubber joint seals on the solid rocket booster, which leaked and caused the Challenger disaster. On January the 28th, 1986, Challenger was launched with seven astronauts on board. It was the second attempt. The weather was very cold in Florida, and ice kept forming on the launch pad. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, we have main engine start, four, three, two, one, and liftoff, liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Roger roll, Challenger. Good roll program confirmed. Challenger now heading down range. No one watching what looked like a successful launch could tell that fuel was leaking from the booster. Engine's beginning throttling down now at 94%. Normal throttles uh, for most of the flight, 104%. We'll throttle down to uh, 65% shortly. 73 seconds after blastoff, Challenger exploded. Seconds. Velocity 2,900 feet per second, altitude 9 nautical miles, downrange distance 7 nautical miles. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. The vehicle... Uh, apparently exploded and that uh, impact uh, in the water at a, a point approximately 28.64 uh, degrees north, uh, 80.28 uh, degrees west. The crew of STS-72 know that most of the real dangers of their mission are packed into the first few minutes after takeoff and the last hour of their return journey to Earth. In the months of training to come, 80% of the astronauts' work will be learning how to deal with emergencies 
which could endanger their lives and destroy the space shuttle endeavor. Before the Challenger accident, astronauts went to the launch pad in unpressurized flying suits. Today's flame-proof and heat-proof orange safety suits have been designed to give a better chance of survival in an emergency at takeoff or landing. With helmets on and visors down, astronauts can breathe oxygen from a supply in their suits. How useful these suits would be in a big fire or explosion is never discussed. The astronauts are trained to believe they can escape from any disaster. Have a sit down or go ahead and hold your pocket. You're ready. I'm ready. You want to go up and get us tucked in? Okay. It'll take a, it'll take a few minutes. No one want any more? You, got, you didn't want any? Linda, you want Yes, I'll have a few seconds. Yeah. Wonderful. Help yourself. There are five shuttle trainers at the Johnson Space Center. All have seen heavy service since the shuttle began flying in 1981. The space program has suffered major budget cuts for years, and there is no spare money to invest in hardware. The astronauts work with a very small training team. These instructors are assigned to STS-72 from the first day of training to the last. The computer programs they use to train the astronauts are updated after every mission. The astronauts are debriefed for hours about their experiences when they return, and everything they have learned goes to improve the training of the next crew. Every training session is like a computer game with two competing teams. The crew on the flight deck, their teachers in the control room. In simulators, which are an exact replica of Endeavour down to the last switch, the astronauts spend a year learning to rescue themselves from really difficult situations. A fire in an engine, a fuel supply failure, a forced landing in North Africa or Bermuda. This is the everyday stuff of training. The astronauts are strapped in their seats just as they will be on board Endeavour. Commander and pilot are side by side, just as they would be on an airliner. All right, there, here we go. One helmet. Good. Next. Tab, hold on. Okay, yeah, tab me in. Come on, front front. Winston Scott and Koichi Wikata will sit behind the commander and the pilot for takeoff. Through the hours of simulation, their job is to check the procedures, while the front seat look for a way out of the problems which appear with distressing regularity. The training teams are scientists who specialize in the different systems on board the shuttle. One instructor is responsible for each system, and a supervisor is in overall control. After liftoff, it takes about eight minutes for the space shuttle to reach orbit. This is the most critical phase of any space flight. Is he doing it? The training team work from a script which includes planned malfunctions to test the crew. We go Okay, we're uh, all on, all with you, and we're probably ready to go to run. Okay, here we go. Okay, T minus nine, guys. Everybody, Quichi, you hear me okay? Uh, you're not connected yet. Endeavor OTC, go for launch. Roger, go for launch. Just a few seconds after launch, a fuel leak is programmed into the computer. 
Uh, Leek said, can you call up uh, Asim over there, please? Asim? Yes, please. Devin Houston, we see a large left RCS leak. Uh, select Know Your Jet and secure the left RCS. You got it. Very good. And secure left RCS. You can check the switch throw up there when he throws it. Oh. And he looks like he selected it. It's just not coming up right away. The fuel leak is spotted in seconds by Brent Jet. He identifies the correct valve and closes it off. Oh, but he didn't have closed here, so you close, close, and these ones can cross strap for that. So he did it right. Yeah. Okay. He did fine. It just it doesn't say here to to do close, so I didn't know that he needed to take that close. I didn't, I didn't heard about it. The shuttle is 28 miles above the Earth and traveling at 3,000 miles an hour. The instructors program an engine failure into the computer. Dever Houston, we copy left engine down, push the button. The astronauts are trained how to react to emergencies, but all decisions and instructions during the real mission come from here, Mission Control Houston. The flight director is in charge throughout the mission. Ten seconds after liftoff, control is passed to him by the launch director at Kennedy. It was in this room that the crisis of Apollo 13 was played out. The training of the flight director to react to emergencies happens at the same time as the training of the astronauts. And booster copy flight, that contact is going to keep us from loading guidance. We can okay, we got a contact failure in that there switch. Houston, guidance Brian, or booster, any way to declare on the left push button, uh, yes, and that's sir. keeping us from loading guidance. We'll have what further. do you want to do? We can comp out FF3 and push it. If that doesn't work, bring it back up and comp out FF2. Because mm -hmm. you don't work. know which one it is. We just have to guess. Guidance, what if we don't mode guidance here? Not a good day flight on no. our TLS. So we highly recommend we get guidance to recognize the engine. Capcom, we'd like to try one at a time. FF2 off, hit the push button, I'll reset, then I FF2 on, and I'll reset. Endeavor Houston, Brian, we'd like you to take FF2 to off, try the push button, bring FF2 back up, and an I'll reset. You want the left arm engine off? All right, there you go. That's it. Bell arm engine off, strength off, interconnect, enable the interconnect. Okay, we're there. And uh, how about 9400? Is that off the chart? I guess, I guess off the charts. Okay, thanks. No oxygen P on the left, so we're going to have to assume prop tail if we uh, have a problem there. Okay. And flight booster. Go ahead. I've got uh, all three LH2 flow control Air valves return. open at this time. I suspect an LH leak. I'll we'll let them wait until it drops below 31.6 to confirm. Okay. Endeavor Houston, negative return. Just a few minutes later, a fuel pressure leak is programmed in. This could lead to fuel starvation in the remaining engine. I suspect we may get an LH leak. You can keep an eye out. Possible LH leak. It was for the LH2. It's LH2. And fine, it is. Uh, it is an LH leak. Okay, you can confirm it. I can confirm. In Denver, Houston, uh, we take have any action? an LH leak. I'll, I'll and pass, just we'll second flight. pass up actions momentarily. Okay, we need to take limits to hard enable flight. Rather, okay, take, uh, two less than thirty-one six. I'd like to go open on the LH pressure. And that's correct, flight. Okay, hard The flight is in jeopardy. Endeavour is eighty miles out and travelling upside down at ten thousand miles an hour over the Atlantic. The shuttle is losing power and unable to continue in orbit. The flight controller orders an emergency landing in North Africa. Okay, no way we can go uphill here. Uh, part of the rules flight, we're supposed to abort for an hour's leak. Okay, because we don't know when we're going to go out. That's correct. You ready to go tail the Ben Gurir? We got it, Fido? Yes, sir. Ben Jules on board flight. Capcom, select Ben Gurir, abort tail. And we do need to get manual throttles. Endeavour Houston. Manual throttles. We first. need manual throttles first, then I need you to select Ben Gurir, abort tail. Roger. Thanks, Booster, for the call. Happy flight. The shuttle crew stabilized the fuel pressure leak. On a single engine, they turn Endeavour towards Morocco. They manage a perfect landing at Ben Gurria. There will be 600 hours of training like this before flight STS-72 is ready to leave. The astronauts and the flight controllers daily pit their wits against the finest computer programs NASA can offer.
The outpost tavern is a wooden shack on a piece of wasteland outside the gates of the space center. The very first astronauts did their drinking here, and the tradition lives on. The outpost is like a space museum. There are pictures on the walls of every one of the 220 astronauts that there have been in the US space program, and there are photographs taken in space with special messages to the outpost from the crew of every mission. The outpost was originally at Ellington Field, the astronauts' airport, but the building was moved here in 1982, lock, stock, and beer barrel. That is a big patch. You know what the only patch was that had no names on it? Shuttle, in the shuttle program? Oh no, in the history of, like, the... Actually, I guess there have been two. No, one. There's one that I know of. There's one. Space trivia? Yeah, in, the whole, in, the in the whole history of oh, manned yeah. space flight, U.S. Yeah. manned space flight, there's only been one patch with no names on it. Who is that? Timothy. There's Apollo 11. That's right. right. I think. But it did, yeah, the first shuttle flight had it on. Yeah, John, yeah, John. Young and Crippen were in there, down the bottom. Most astronaut training is done with computers, but pilots must get the feel of the real thing. This Boeing 707 aircraft is about the same size and weight as the shuttle, and Brent Jett, who has never landed anything heavier than a fighter before, takes his very first training flight with an instructor. The shuttle has no power of its own. When it re-enters Earth's atmosphere, it is a giant glider, known affectionately to trainee pilots as the flying brick. Many hours of instruction are devoted to the last few minutes of the shuttle's journey. Other aspects of the return to Earth are taught on a Gulfstream business jet, which has been modified to perform like the space shuttle during landing. Endeavour will drop from space at a speed of nearly 300 miles per hour and without any engine power. Yeah, that's pretty good. Brian Duffy and his instructor take the Gulfstream up to 35,000 feet and switch the modified engines into reverse power. The jet falls at 200 feet per second towards the runway below. Okay. Nav state's offset a little bit to the right. I don't know how yours looks. Uh, mine's the same, about a half a runway width. Yeah. We get the French lane, trail. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Radar. Radar. Let's hit him. Radar. Four thousand. Speed range working pretty hard. 
Three thousand. Okay. Board. Board's come in. Twenty-three. And the pre-flare. Two thousand yeah. pre-flare. Yeah, good call in the close. Yeah. Okay, you can arm the wheels. Arm the pre-flare. Gears arm. Three L seven. Max air speed. Five hundred. Board. Board to twenty-eight. Three hundred. Two eighty. Same coming. Two hundred. Two seventy. Gear down. Roger gear. Same coming. Orbiting gears down. Seventy-five. Two fifty. Fifty. Forty. Thirty. Two forty. Twenty. Seventeen. Two thirty. Twelve. And eight. Two twenty three four two fifteen two ten two oh five two one six ten clap three seven. Christ. A little bumpy. Twenty five feet above the earth, power is again reversed for a steep climb back. Ten approaches every training session. Three hundred before launch day. Challenger disaster. On, <laughs> onto the national news desk, you know, the guy who does the national news in like three minutes. Yeah. This right was on there, it. Huh? Yeah. Wow. Now, there's mm -hmm. a potential problem which may cause massive ground. Oh, oh, By the time the shuttle is past the top of the tower, it's going 100 miles an hour. The shuttle, its boosters, and the loaded fuel tank weigh about 110 tons. The 7 million pounds of thrust push the shuttle very fast. Just 35 seconds into the flight, the shuttle is going more than 700 miles an hour as it passes through the sound barrier. Now let's freeze this picture. Here is the booster segment. NASA calls it a field joint that experienced the O-ring burn through on Challenger in 1986. The hot gas burned like a torch into the fuel tank causing the explosion. When they looked at STS-71's boosters, they saw a little bit of uh, a surprise. They looked in and they saw some heat damage to uh, an O-ring on there. Uh -huh. And they didn't know that. They hadn't hadn't taken that nozzle apart to look at it uh, until after 70 had launched after it. Well, just yesterday they looked at 70's nozzles after they towed the solid rocket boosters back into the Cape, took them apart, uh, looked and they saw similar damage. So, uh -oh. so same, we're in a situation. Same areas? Yeah, same, same damage same in the same area. Uh, mm -hmm. Ever since after Challenger, uh, we haven't seen any damage uh, in any of these O-rings. And now we've seen two, so mm -hmm. that would lead you to believe that you know, something might have changed and you better look at it and understand what the problem is before you go on you right. and, and fix it if, it if it needs to be fixed. And we've got some diagrams here and there are a number of different areas where there are joints. The one where the, they've been seeing the damage is this one right here. You know, that's one of the most important ones because this is the throat of the nozzle. The hot gas is flowing right across that part right there. So that's the place that's most likely to see hot gas. Mm -hmm. There's another joint where the segments of the solid rocket booster, where they go together at these joints right here. They, we call those field joints because the segments are put together in the field. So there are three O-rings here, and that's about the size of them. And you can imagine having some 3,000 degree gas coming through there, and all you have as a barrier is this rubber right here. That's where we stand with it. I guess we'll hear more here in the, you know, the next week or so. Mm -hmm. And there are other crews, the guys that are ahead of us, that want to hear even more than we want to hear. Sure. So. Brian Duffy and his wife Jan moved into their home near the Space Center the day before the Challenger disaster. Another O-ring problem has brought back memories for everyone. The wives of two of STS-72's rookies are eager to hear about Jan Duffy's experiences. She was unpacking her furniture when the news about Challenger came through. We were building a house in Taylor Crest, and we actually closed on the house on Friday and moved in on Monday, and Tuesday, Challenger happened. So I, I was stopped unpacking the boxes, and what do we do now, you know? And um, I actually said to Brian, if you don't want to do this anymore, it's fine with me. And he looked at me like, why wouldn't I want to do this? They're going to find out what the problem is, and we'll be back in the air, and I'm ready to go, you know? I had no association with NASA right. whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And if I was married to someone at that point in time, I would have been like, we're leaving. Bye. <laughs> I'm used to what he does. and. I'm happy for him. It's really hard to watch the launch, so. I yeah. watched it when it happened, and it had one certain meaning for me, and like, I can't watch mm -hmm. it anymore. It's like, I, I don't like this. But like, I know. I don't want to see it. I just don't want to see it anymore. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't want to ruin it by watching prints and thinking that something bad's going to happen. I know. And I'm not going to let me myself think about that. I just want to think about. This is Brent going down his dream, you know. Well, that's right. That's and, true. That's, you know, right. that's, 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 that's He's so excited. I don't want to think about what could happen. Actually, somebody you know? said to me, what's it like watching launch? I said, well, 
you know, Brian's been a pilot for 29 right. years or something. Right. I said, but I'm not usually there for the takeoffs. You know, right. so. His chances of d having something happen to him are so small compared to what he used to do. He used to land a boat, land on a boat out in the sea that was going like this, mm -hmm. you know, and he was doing test flying mm -hmm. where they were testing to see if this new thing was going to work. <laughs> and he was doing that several times a week, right. you know. That compared to what he's doing now, once a year. That's what I say too. Yeah, yeah. it just it doesn't. Brian was like, a fighter pilot, <laughs> a test pilot, and now this. And I never worried about it before. Why worry now? <laughs> but Sue, it must be a little bit different for you. Well, I think one difference is that if something happens to him, it's a matter of public record, and all the public knows. I mean, if your husband is sick and goes in the hospital and dies, it's a private matter. But here, it becomes a public matter, and that's what kind of bothers me. The O-ring problem was located and fixed by July. A tiny gas pathway was found under the skirt of a booster rocket. It was quickly repaired, but it meant that the next few missions would all be delayed by a few weeks. The summer holidays had been and gone when the STS-72 crew arrived in Florida, hopefully to watch Endeavour's last launch before she is handed over to them. If the shuttle doesn't launch today, there's a rumor that STS-72 could be delayed for several months, or even canceled. It had it all over. Both our crews now uh, depart the white room, and they'll be leaving the launch pad soon. They're uh, getting into the vehicle. They'll be going to their fallback area, their designated spot for launch. Okay. Uh, met the spec yeah. two, one, booster ignition, and right. there we yes. Look at that. Right. Look at that. Oh. Yeah. probably six or eight of these launches, but it's still just as spectacular as the first time I saw it. It's just, uh, I'm awed at the power. You know, seven and a half million pounds of thrust coming out of the back end of that thing is just, just you amazing. Get on top. I get to sit on top of it, how about that? You know, no matter how many times you watch them, I, I don't know about you guys, every time I see it, I, I forgot how bright those boosters yeah, are. Yeah, I can't even look at them. How many have you seen? Yeah, yeah. Huh? Well, there's a bunch of happy dogs up there. Yeah. yeah. So I guess uh, our schedule will firm up now. Everything will be become official. Okay. Time, time to get serious. <laughs> We've been floating up to this point, but this kind of this kind of made it permanent. Yeah. 